Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Kitchener Public Library. My name is Carrie Hutchinson, and I'm the Communications Manager here for the library. And I'm here to welcome you to 85 Queen, A Morning with Peter Mansbridge. <laughs> I would like to begin today's event with a territorial acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that Kitchener Public Library and all of its locations are settled on land that is the traditional home of the Chinantan, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee. We acknowledge that this land is part of the Haldeman Tract, an area that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River that was promised to the Haudenosaunee, Six Nations, and other Indigenous allies in 1784. We recognize and deeply appreciate Indigenous peoples' historical and ongoing connection to the land. We are thankful for and enriched by the contributions of all Indigenous peoples have made and continue to make in shaping and strengthening this community. As people who live and work in Kitchener, we aim to renew our accountability to those Indigenous nations and all Indigenous peoples and communities living in Canada and around the world today. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to truth and reconciliation now and for future generations. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us this morning. Today's event is part of the City of Kitchener's Imagine It programming. We appreciate the city's ongoing support, which helps us bring award-winning and critically acclaimed authors and speakers to Kitchener. A special thanks to the team at Simon & Schuster Canada for support for today's event. Joining us this morning is our moderator, Joe Pavia. Joe is a reporter and editor at our local CBC KW 89.1 FM radio station and will be a familiar voice for many of you. He's normally heard weekdays on the morning edition, but also covers a wide range of news and feature stories for both radio and web. Please join me in welcoming Joe to our stage this morning. Peter Mansbridge is one of Canada's most respected journalists. He is the former chief correspondent for CBC News and anchor of The National, where he worked for 30 years reporting national and international news. He has received over a dozen national awards for broadcast excellence, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. In 2008, he was made an Officer of Canada, the country's highest civilian honor, and in 2012, he was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. He is the author of national bestsellers, Off the Record, Extraordinary Canadians, and One on One. In 2021, Extraordinary Canadians was selected as our One Book, One Kimi Read here in Kitchener. Peter is here today to discuss his fourth book, How Canada Works, co-written with Mark Bulgach. How Canada Works is a collection of personal stories that shine a light on everyday jobs, that keep our nation running and the inspiring people who perform them with empathy and kindness. Please join me in welcoming Peter to our stage. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Excellent. Thanks. How's everybody this morning? <laughs> Is there anyone from Stratford here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It's great, uh, you know, it's great to be here with these good people who are, you know, spending their Saturday morning right listen right to what a couple old guys talk about books. <laughs> right I, <that's>, <laughs> I think it's wonderful, and I, I really appreciate you being here. Talking about books, but talking about to the people in the books. And when I when I got my copy of the book, the first thing I did was flip through it to see if there was anybody I knew, and there wasn't. I thought, I thought you were going to say to see whether you were in it. No. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm holding out hope. Anyway, uh, and then the second one was to look to see if there was anyone from the area because maybe there's a potential contact for uh, a story, and we'll we'll get to uh, who that person was. Right. But I. Um, the one thing I was fascinated is is just how you got everyone together in this in this novel in this book to tell their stories. How were you able to collect uh, connect everyone 
uh, together for it. Well, in many ways, they connected each other. Uh, and you can tell that when you read the, read the book in terms of the way we're all connected. That was what we were trying to get at, uh, how Canadians are connected in ways they've never even thought of before. We depend on each other in ways that we hadn't realized, I don't think. Um, the genesis of the book was the idea, Mark and I, were, this is Mark Bogutch, my, my good friend and uh, who I worked with for years at the uh, CBC. We've written a couple of books together now. Um, we got together at a time when this whole issue of whether or not Canada is broken was at the forefront. And what we both realized is that's an interesting political argument. And it is, and you can take either side of that argument about whether the country is broken or not. But we wanted to look at it a different way because that argument is more based on how governments operate, how departments operate or don't operate, and how you know Canadians are affected by uh, how they operate. What we wanted to look at was people, uh, and you know I hate to use the phrase, but ordinary people who are in everyday jobs. And so we sat down and we came up with a, a list of jobs that we were kind of interested in one way or another. And they were a variety of different jobs, as you'll see uh, in the book, and we'll talk about some of them. But then we had to figure out, okay, where are these jobs? Who's in them? Okay. Who do we want to talk to? We wanted it to be a national book, so obviously there had to be a, uh, a sense of the country in it. And we're pretty proud at, uh, with the fact that we you know, profiled you know, more than a couple of dozen people and every province is represented uh, inside the book. Um, there's diversity on gender, there's diversity on culture, there's all of that. Then we interviewed each one of them, um, mostly by phone, okay. transcribed the interviews, went back, did secondary uh, interviews, and sometimes more than that, uh, with the same people, got the transcri transcriptions, and then decided that we, uh, we wanted, as we did in Extraordinary Canadians, to do these segments in their voice, not in our voice. So we took um, what we'd written down of what they'd had to say and shaped them into stories. So it's really their words uh, shaped by us into a, into a way of telling their story. And uh, that's how it kind of took off. We, every, each one of the people in the book had the opportunity once we were finished to look at what they were saying to make sure it's still aligned with their feelings about... Uh, their lives, and uh, so they had the final say. So, but how were you able to find, say, a window washer, or actually he had a more formal title, to a forensic <laughs> pathologist um, from uh, Guelph? Now from the, Guelph, yeah. Yeah, the, right. the window washer, Noah Nava, a licensed rope access technician. Rope access <laughs> technician. As soon, as soon as I called him a, a high-rise window washer, he says, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, don't, you don't understand. That's not what I am. I am a rope access technician. Um, so, how did I find him? Yeah. I decided, it, it was actually my uh, idea to do a high-rise window washer because I've always been fascinated with that profession. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of heights and, uh, and uh, I, you know, I don't even like going on an elevator, let alone the, um, hanging off the side of a building, which is what Noah does. Um, but we decided, okay, this kind of job we want from this area of the country, this blah, 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 blah. And then I said, okay, let's go for Ebb. We don't have anyone from Edmonton. Hmm. I'll, and I just phoned around, okay. did the research of the different uh, companies that dealt with high rises. Oh, wow. uh, and whether they're office towers or condominium buildings, uh, what have you. Uh, and that's how we end. I said, I'm looking for a guy in your business who's a good talker, has a sense okay. of humor, but also can explain to me what he does there. Yeah. And that's how I ended up with Noah. And uh, like many of the people in the book, you know, I'd phone them or Mark would phone them. And I'd phone them and I'd say, hi, it's, it's Peter Mansbridge. I want to talk to you about your job. And they'd say, <laughs> yeah, sure, it's Peter Mansbridge. <laughs> yeah, right. and, th and then they'd, they'd say, well, look, you know, I, I'm not very interesting. I don't really have anything to say. I don't have an interesting job. And I said, no, 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 I don't, that's not the way to look at it. I, I'll, I'll decide whether or not it's interesting. Right. 
And with every single person we contacted, they were more than a little bit interesting. Uh, yeah. Because you know, there are no ordinary people. Sure, sure. Everybody has their extraordinary nature inside them as well. And the more comfortable you got talking to these people, the more that shone through. And, and I noticed that while I was reading in the, the stories of the people, and it, it, something struck me. It was a, a quote Henry Champ, uh, who's at, at NBC and then CBC, and he said, the difference between Americans and Canadians, I always remember this, this is a years ago quote, that when you ask a, an American their opinion, like a streeter, they'll tell you right up front exactly what they think. But when you ask a Canadian, they'll say, well, what is my boss going to think? What is my family going to think? <laughs> what is everyone else going to think? Did that factor in at all? I, you know, I think we're, we're naturally cautious, cautious, most Canadians. Not all Canadians, but yeah. uh, most Canadians, uh, until they're comfortable. Yeah. And then away they go. Uh, and they're quite open, as all these people were, about, uh, you know, about their jobs, the impact they have on, uh, they feel, on their community, uh, and uh, the impact they have really on the country. Yeah. And uh, so uh, away we, uh, you know, went from that uh, that point. They were they they were all very talkative once you got them going. L look at uh, looking at the license rope access technician. I mean, that's not something you go to school for. Um, <laughs> but is that the, so? Uh, Noah always wanted to do that. Was there something though he wanted to do before? Were there any of the people that you spoke to that they? Had this, you know, there was a journey headed somewhere else, and then they ended up here. Yeah, I'll answer that. Let me just say in, in preface, because it picks up on your last question, too. Um, most of these people, you know, had no sense that their jobs could be important to outside the community of workers that they were involved with. And I think the more we talked to them, the more they understood what we were trying to get at, and they opened up. In the case of, uh, of Noah, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned from a high-rise window washer to a forensic uh, biologist. The forensic biologist lives in Guelph, and that's the beauty of this book. Those jobs, you, you say to yourself, really, Mansbridge, what are you talking about? A high-rise window washer and a forensic biologist? How could those be in any way be interesting to your thesis about how Canada works? Exactly that's how. Because we are all in such different jobs in our lives. And what this book does is, is open up trying to understand why they're important and how they're part of that, you know, millions of Canadians who make the country work. Do we have issues? Do we have problems? Sure we do. But a lot of things go right, and they go right because of the kind of people yeah. in this book. Now, I've already forgotten what your question uh, the, about Noah uh, was. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> no, the unconventional, uh, like, did they, did they actually start out doing right. what, they, what you wrote With about? Noah, I actually graduated from Red River Community College in Alberta. Then he went to, like many young Albertans do, went to the oil fields in northern Alberta. And he enjoyed that work, but he didn't find it fulfilling. He used to be, uh, you know, he worked on the ground or, or near the surface of the ground. But he used to watch with fascination the guys who worked up on the rigs. And he thought, I'm fascinated by that. I, I don't mind heights. I'd like to do something, but maybe not in the cold weather of northern <laughs> Alberta. <laughs> So he went back down, he took a training course in rope access technician work, uh, which is a quite involved course, not surprisingly. Sure, sure. Um, and he got hooked. And so that's what he does. And I mean, if we see, and you probably see here in, you know, in some of the higher buildings in Kitchener, the platform yep. for washing. That's not what he's on. He's on a rope, <laughs> he has access to a rope, and he just hangs on the rope and goes down the side of the building. And he's got a, you know, a pail of water wow. and a squeegee and, you know, uh, four or five other um, uh, people who are w working with him on whichever side of the building they're working on. Um, but it's like I, I still, 
I just still find the whole job fascinating and trying to understand, you, you might say, well, really, well, why is that important? How does that make the country work? Yeah. Simple reason, <laughs> you know. Why do you clean your own windows? Why do you clean your window on your car? So you can see out. There are literally millions of people who either work or live in high-rise buildings in Canada. They're usually washed twice a year, spring and fall. If they weren't, after a couple of years, you would, have, you would literally have a hard time looking out the window because it really picks up dirt. So we talked about that, and then I said, what do you see when you're going down the side of a building? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, I've seen it all. <laughs> and I said, well, like, why don't you like turn away? <laughs> and he said, I'm there to clean the glass. <laughs> I'm not there to look at the sights outside. I said, so it's, you know, you just keep moving. Go down another floor, see what's happening there. <laughs> an, an employment, a job that's really not conventional, as we were mentioning. Maybe exactly. not somebody would not want to consider. Maybe they would want to consider after reading Noah. But another right. one is, tell me about Luann. Luann, uh, the funeral Luann director. Jones is in um, Toronto. She's in uh, Scarborough. She's, her, hers is a great story. She's a wonderful woman. Uh, when she was, um, you know, growing up in school, she wanted to be a flight attendant, but she's quite short, and she was told, you're too short to be a flight attendant. And so she took those tests. Remember those tests we used to take in high school that would kind of indicate to you what you might be good at? You know, kind of multiple choice tests. And yeah. So she took that, and it came back, funeral director. <laughs> and she said, no. No, 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 I, I'm not interested in being a funeral director. So she went back to the front of the class, picked up a, a test once again, did it again, changed all her answers. And it came back uh, cosmetologist or uh, hairdresser. And she thought, okay, that's, that's kind of more like it, but there's some similarities there. By the time she got ready to go to college, she uh, took another test, and it came back funeral director. Wow. So she thought, I better do th This sounds like I just might enjoy this. Enjoy is probably a <laughs> tough word to use in this. But she became, you know, one of the top funeral directors in Toronto. She owns her own funeral home, and she does everything. And she says, when you take the funeral director course at college, you have to know how to do everything, every aspect of the job. Uh, and that includes, you know, the aspect of the job that you probably think of when you first hear the term funeral director. But she loves her job, and she describes it this way. She says, during the pandemic, during COVID, we all had an enormous amount of respect for first responders. And that's understandable. They were there when we weren't there, when most of us were kind of in our homes, locked down. First responders were at the hospital, at the police station, at the fire station. You know, goes on the list of grocery clerks, you know, truck drivers. They all went to work while we weren't. She said, the first responders I've got enormous respect for because they cared about people. They weren't just doing their jobs. They cared about people. She said, I'm not a first responder. I'm a last responder. <laughs> but I've got to care just as much as the first responder does about who I'm dealing with. They've passed, but they owe, uh, earn, and have earned my respect yeah. to do the job for them that I should do. And their families. I may be the last responder, but the pressure and the obligations are really, in many ways, similar to the first responders. Wow. So she's a great story, and she's a, she has her sense of humor. And you'll read some things that are funny that you might not have thought 
that they could have a sense of humor in that job, but uh, she does. Uh, I want to ask you about Valerie in Guelph, but first, did you take an aptitude test when you were in school? Do you remember? You know, I, I did take an aptitude test. Listen, I was, I was not very good at uh, school. Mm. I, never, I never got through high school. I didn't graduate. I never went to university. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you the facts. No, that's, that's I what can I, relate. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah. And I just got lucky like you did, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that in those final chaotic years of high school in the mid-1960s, that I took one of those tests somehow. But, you know, I can honestly tell you, I do not remember how it turned out. I don't know what they said I should be. You know, a rock star? Yeah. I would have taken that. I would have taken that. Yeah. NHL player, I would have taken that. Yeah. But uh, I know it didn't say either of those two. I would imagine it would have said something with the arts or performance or speaking. No. I'm just I guessing. Maybe I'm putting my, yeah. my aptitude test into yours. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm basically a pretty shy guy. You know, people assume, oh, he, you know, he could be an actor, he could be this, he could be that, he's very outgoing. I'm not. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, you know, I fluked into my job. I mean, if any of you know anything about me, you know how I ended up at the CBC. I mean, after that incredible academic career I'd had, <laughs> I, I ended up working in northern Manitoba at a small airline in Churchill, Manitoba, where I was like 19 years old and I was doing everything, loading bags, you know, um, keeping the engines warm in the, in the cold weather, selling tickets, helping load the plane, passenger planes. And one day on the f there was a flight going from Churchill to Winnipeg and it was really busy and the, the main ticket agent asked me to announce the flight on the PA system. Uh, and so I did. I went up to the microphone. I said, Transair, flight 106 for Thompson, the Paw, and Winnipeg is now ready for boarding at gate one. We only had one gate. <laughs> 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 but it sounded good, you know. I'd heard them talk that way in the Winnipeg airport, and I thought, why can't we talk that way here? Anyway, everybody starts heading over towards gate one. And this guy comes the other way to her, to her, towards me because I was right in, in an open uh, waiting room where the microphone was. And he says, you've got a really good voice. Have you ever thought about being in radio? And I said, no, I, you know, I've never thought about being in radio. And he says, I'm the manager of the CBC Northern Service Station wow. here in Churchill. Yeah. And I can't find anybody to do the late night shift. Would you be interested? I said, well, of course. Now, this story tells you something about my luck, because it was just the right place at the right time story, but also it tells you something about the CBC. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, there was nobody from Human Resources there saying, show us your graduation yeah. certificate. None of that. They didn't no. ask anything. No. Except nobody asked me my graduation either. No. Uh, yeah. no, All I wanted to know was, whether you could talk, right? Yep. That's so <laughs> Basically, true. Basically, and, so and true. introduce 45s, which yep. was what we used in those days. So, um, And you did it so well that you advanced and you inspired many in journalism, yeah, including, I mean, I've, I've, wait a minute, this is the gushing part that I was oh, telling you okay. about. This is where Peter Mansbridge inspired me. I was just going to tell you a couple of things, and then we'll go back to your book, okay? I promise. But there was this one time, there's two times, and I'll tell you the one time, something I learned was watching The National, and you know how the, the picture comes up on the side and you're, you're on camera left when you're looking at the TV. And all you did was, and I don't know who you were talking about, what the story was, but all you did was say, that's not according to this guy here. And I thought, wow, I've never seen an anchor do that before. That was so cool. I'm going to have to try it in audio in a newscast. And I did, and it worked out pretty cool. But the other one, though, the two times was... Um, I was actually just thinking of this recently when I was watching The Crown, the last season, right. when Princess Diana died. Right. Uh, long weekend, Labor Day weekend, watch, listening and watching you on TV, and just how calm Peter was relaying the story, and 9-11 as well. And I thought, geez, 
that is so cool. That is something that you, I just learned from you. So, <laughs> so there you go. So thank you. For thank that. you. Well, that, that, you know, that relationship between, with your audience, whether it's radio or television or print, it doesn't matter what it is, um, you know, is developed by a degree of trust yeah. in the person you're, you know, you're getting your news from, a and a, a degree of comfort and calmness when, when it's chaotic, yeah. and it can be could be anything. It yeah. could be war. It could be a terrible accident. It could be, you know, 9/11. It could be, you know, it could be any number of things. Um, but that trust is positioned around those three things, and trust is all about truth. Um, you know, truth is is absolutely imperative. Mm -hmm. Truth is what we need. Truth, in fact, in many ways is all we need. But we need the truth. And that seems to be harder and harder to get these days in a lot of different areas. Yeah, true. But speaking of truth, and this mm -hmm. is uh, truth, and I want to segue into the forensic biologist, because there is, you're talking about DNA kind of truth. Tell yeah. me, what can you tell us about Valerie Blackmore? This is the Guelph connection now yeah. for anyone who's from Guelph. Valerie lives in, um, in Guelph, and she, like uh, some of you, I'm sure, was fixated on her television in the early 90s for the trial of O.J. Simpson. Oh, wow. And she was trying to decide which pathway to take with her life. Yeah. And she'd always been interested in science, but she got fixated on the whole discussion about DNA and its, important, and its importance in trying to determine um, well, basically to determine guilt. And so that's what kind of launched her into, uh, into a career that is so important to how Canada works because it's her expertise that can make the guilty be guilty and just as importantly, make the innocent give them the opportunity to defend themselves. So it's a very important aspect of, you know, the law. Um, and you know, for, for Valerie, it's a pretty it's a pretty neat job. I mean, we see we see television shows built around the idea of, of forensic biology. It's not quite as fancies you see on the CSI yeah. uh, programming, or as easy as you see on the CSI programming. Um, but the idea is there, and sh she's in it, and she, you know, she loves, she loves her job, and she, you know, and that's when you say, like, how can that be in, in any way similar to, you know, Noah's story in Edmonton washing windows? Well, they're very different, but the end game is the same. They're helping Canada work. I didn't know what they did. I do now. I have a much better appreciation of how it can affect my life, both things. Um, so that was what we we're trying to get at here. When will you look at, uh, the, and you've talked about uh, a few of the people now, but is there any one person, one career, one job that had an impact on you that kind of keeps coming back in your m memory sure. reel? They all do in, in one way or another. Sure. They really do, they really do. Because um, they open your eyes to what other people do and how, how it impacts you. You know, whether it's the dairy farmer in southern Alberta, the air traffic controller in Halifax, the, the list goes on. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, because I think the answer to your question is in the very first chapter. But this is a book you don't read, you don't have to read from front to back. You can pick it up anywhere in the, in, in the book, open it up and read a story. It will have an impact yeah. on you. Mm -hmm. um, or you can go the traditional uh, way of going from uh, front to back. The first story is about a, uh, a fellow resident of Ontario. He's the uh, chief of the First Nation in Neskintanga, which is in northern Ontario. It's a couple hundred kilometers north of 
Thunder Bay. His name's Wayne Munoz. Now, you may never have heard of him. You may never have heard of his First Nation by name, but you know their story. And this is why you know their story. That You know their story because for almost 30 years, they've been under a boil water advisory. Wow. They have no pure drinking water. They got to boil their water. Every day, every family, every meal. They have a, a plant, filtration plant, but it's not working. And literally millions of dollars have been spent trying to get it working. But it's not working right yet. The government has promised them over and over again that they'd get it working. Not yet. Now, why is Wayne interesting? Wayne's interesting not just because of that. He's interesting because he's the chief of a First Nation in a remote northern Ontario community. Like many First Nations in many different parts of the country in remote areas where there are constant challenges. Not just water, education, um, food. We think our food prices are high. We ain't seen nothing yet compared to what it's like to fly in food, which is what they've got to do through the winter, or truck it in in the summer to remote communities like that. And the costs just go through the roof. Dealing with that. The education system. Most of the kids, residential schools are a thing of the past, but for most of these kids, they've got to fly out to go to school. They're away from their parents for long long times. And the kids that are staying at home are challenged with the, the very issue of living in a remote community when you can see the rest of the world is living in a very different life. And you can see it because you've got satellite television. And why am I living this way when kids my age are living a very different lifestyle? So what does the chief have to deal with? He's got to deal with families who are suddenly faced in the middle of the night with a child suicide. And he's got to go to the home at 3 in the morning, not only to comfort them, but to, in some cases, help cut the kid down. This is his life. But the story of his life and how it became that way all hinges on a moment when he was 10 years old. I'm not going to tell you what it is now. I want you to, I want you to, I want you to read it, because it'll take you there, it'll take you into that moment, and you'll understand, in a different way, what changed his life, and how he becomes he became so fixated, in wanting to help others, in his First Nation. And you know, I was thinking of the chief. When we together did the land acknowledgement at the beginning of this session. And I was thinking, you know, we're, as I said earlier, you know, we're not a perfect country. We love our country. There's lots of great things. We're the envy of much of the world because of the kind of country we have. But there are still issues that we have that we've got to address. And one of them is reconciliation. It's a part of trying to understand that relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. It's what Justice Murray Sinclair begged us to do. It's what Gord Downey begged us to do. A friend of mine spent the last two years of his life fighting brain cancer, yet devoting every possible moment he had to this cause, reconciliation. And so we say, well, how far have we come? What have we really done? What have we actually achieved? It's baby steps. But they're heading in the right direction. And that example that we started this session off with is one of them. Ten years ago, we weren't doing that. We are now. There's lots more we need to do, lots more. But it's starting. And we can only hope it continues.
or both aspects of this relationship. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. So read the, the chief story. As I said, as I keep saying, every one of these stories will open your eyes a little bit to the way other people work and yet how it impacts us and how we live, how we're all in many ways connected. When I read the chief's uh, story, I was I could not believe 30 years of boil water advisory and what popped in my head. So remember the toilet paper crisis that we had during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah. Was that just doesn't seem to compare? And I, and I want to actually talk about the, the pandemic because so much has changed with the pandemic. And you mentioned with Luann being the last responder. Um, how do you, well, there's one way to address, but there's how did you address the change of work uh, with the pandemic in the book? Well, there was a change of work. There was also a much greater respect for work mm -hmm. of certain jobs. Oh, for sure. That literally we, we didn't think about before. Those of us who weren't in the service industry, say in a grocery store, didn't really think about what happened there. Right. One of the people in the book here, Rashev Brown, was a, uh, you know, a grocery supervisor in um, Etobicoke, mm -hmm. Toronto. And he talks about the, the sudden influx of when people came to the store, how they kind of bent over backwards to thank those grocery store clerks mm -hmm. and the workers in the back room and the butchers and all of that who contributed to the, to, to the opportunity for them to keep their food chain going. And so they would come, they would come up to me in the store and say, oh, thank you so much, we, you know, we just love you, we can't believe what you've gone through to come to work, mm -hmm. uh, to serve us. And <laughs> Rashev says that, you know, they, they were, you know, you know, they were overcome by these, these wonderful uh, conversations that they'd have with their customers who'd never talked to them before. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly we're praising them. He said that when it ended, the pandemic ended, we used to sit in the back room of the grocery store and said, when are we going to return to normal when they loved us? <laughs> <laughs> Remember how we were saying during the worst times, when's normal going to come back again? <laughs> they were saying it afterwards about what it was like then. Anyway, his, you know, his story is just one of those that you, you realize that we didn't think about. Yeah. You know, most of us were not in that business. So it was a new respect. But work has changed, you know, working from home versus working in the office. I mean, I live in Stratford, but we have a small place in, in, in Toronto, a condo with w windows, um, <laughs> which we pull the curtains on when we... <laughs> but, but um, you know, uh, uh, part of what's happened in downtown Toronto is all these office towers, many of them are empty. Wow. They're just empty. Um, because people are still working from home and they don't want to come back in and the companies who, which thought their, you know, their production values would drop as a result of workers not being on, in the office but being at home instead, I found actually in many cases it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have left with all the space, what are they going to do with it? And so, you know, some of uh, the condo people have said, well, we're going to turn them into condos, there's only one problem. There are no toilets in all the, <laughs> oh, <laughs> in all the rooms, and the, it'll be a total refit on plumbing for those buildings to make it work. One quick note on your <laughs> on the toilet paper reference you made, Rashev. I asked him, said, "What is the one item more than anything else that sells most in a grocery store? You know, the big grocery stores, like he worked in toilet paper." And I said, oh, you, you mean during the pandemic? He said, no, 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 toilet paper. Wow. That yeah. is, that's what we run out of most. He says, nothing like what happened during the pandemic where it was absolutely crazy. He said, it was so crazy, I used to phone home, and my partner would get on the phone, she'd say, Chef, you got to bring more toilet paper home. <laughs> 
And he'd say, what are you talking about? Like, I've been bringing toilet paper home for 10 days. We've got it in every room of the house, <laughs> everywhere, even where there's no toilet. Yeah, We've yeah. got toilet paper, and it's in the trunk of the car. It's oh, everywhere. My. And she said, well, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to need toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. When, when I was looking through the, uh, the book, as I mentioned, I was looking to see if I knew anyone, uh, anyone from the area. The other one was the list of the, the careers, the jobs that you had. Who's not on? Is there, um, are there other areas that you, know, you would consider looking at that maybe didn't make? Oh, yeah. Chapter? I mean, let's face it. There's more than 28 jobs, <laughs> different Good jobs point. in, in the country, right? So, I mean, there's... You know, there could be a volume two, three, four, five. You could yeah. go on forever. Um, but the point wasn't the number. Yeah. It really was, these are the 28 we chose, and in every one of them, we learned something, and you'll learn something. Even if you have a friend in that business, you're going you're gonna to learn stuff in this book about what your fellow Canadians do to help make the country work. In other words, to help you right? Yeah. Makes your life easier for what these people do and, and for what you do uh, makes their life easier. That's the whole point of, you know, the, the we're all connected right idea. Yeah. And uh, the more we talked to these people, the more we went, wow, this is, you know, this is amazing. I never thought of that. I mean, there's lots of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many of you are in the agriculture business, but I always thought the dairy business was basically a guy with, you know, a couple hundred cattle and uh, every day he goes out and he has to milk the cows. It's a lot different now. Yeah. <laughs> the guy we talked to is a dairy farmer in southern Manitoba. His name is David Weens, right down near the U.S. border. His grandfather bought the, the ranch when he was... You know, when he was a, a young uh, farmer, starting off in dairy, he had 200 cows, which was a lot of cows in the 20s, and he, in the 1920s. And now he has thousands of cattle. Wow. And it's all automated and really automated. The cows are milked three times a day. He's, not even, he's not even there. Wow. They come into the barn themselves. They really? hook themselves up themselves. <laughs> really? Really. And they're milked, and off they go. It's all computerized, and there's a chip in each one of the cows, so he can at any time of day pick up his phone, dial in the, the chip that he wants, yeah. to tell him exactly where the cow is, okay. how much milk it's produced that day, whether there's any issues with the cow, whether the production is down, whether there's clearly some kind of um, uh, physical issue. Sure, sure. He can tell all that by computer and then, then go and deal with it. But it's like such, a, it's so high tech. When you drive by that <laughs> dairy farm, wow. It's, it gives you a whole different perspective on what's going on in there. I knew about the machines, but all the stuff up until, you know, they, the, cows come, the cows come home and hook yeah. themselves up, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Uh, we're going to uh, take some questions from you. Peter's going to take some questions. That's not we. That's the royal we. It's going to be Peter <laughs> who's going to take your questions. So if you have a question, uh, get ready to ask your question. I will ask you uh, one more, and and um, and this goes back to the aptitude test, not, not really. Mm -hmm. But when you looked at even reading through some of these, is there one, one job you thought, oh, that would have been cool? I like the air traffic controller story. Yeah. Uh, it was, in fact, something I considered. Uh, actually, the summer before I had fluked my way into uh, the CBC, because I've always been fascinated by aviation and flying, um, and I thought I'd, I might want to be an air traffic controller. Oh, cool. As it turned out, it didn't happen, but talking to Amber Doiron in Halifax, uh, who's the focus of our, our story on that, uh, it, you know... It's a fascinating job. Yeah. She got convinced she could be an air traffic controller because when she was a kid playing soccer in Moncton, um, one of the neighbors, another coach, who was an air traffic controller, 
said, you know, this could be the job for you, Amber, because you have great vision on the soccer field. You know where everybody is. Interesting. You know, okay. you, you know where to go to uh, take a pass. You know where to kick the ball to it to be received by somebody running down the field because you, you see them all, all the time. You need that in this job because you got seven monitors in front of you that are telling you everything about planes in the air, planes on the ground, vehicles on the ground, weather, everything. Wow. And you got to know it all. And you've got to scan those monitors all the time. You've got to be aware of what's on them all the time to make the decisions you have to make, and you've only got the split second to make them. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was even more excited when I, when I read that about what happens in that control tower. Now, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. And that's why they have a, a schedule where it's sort of 45 minutes on and 90 minutes off. It's a constant through the day. Oh. They have to have the ability to relax, calm down before they go back in. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Questions over to you. Anyone uh, want to speak to Peter? Have a comment or question? There's, there's, a, hand up right there's here. a hand up right here. And we'll get the microphone to you. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Mike Critch's impressions of you? Of whose first impressions? Uh, Mike Critch on 22. Mike Bridge. Mark Critch? He doesn't. Oh, Critch. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Uh, Mark's a great friend, and he's a very funny guy. Him and Mercer, you know, they're they're two great products of a fabulous province in Newfoundland, and they have that that spirit of and, and that humor that comes from there. And so, it's an honor to be even mentioned by either one of those two, <laughs> uh, no matter how much they uh, kind of make fun of you. So, uh, I, uh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the question. So, just raise your hand, and we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, there are more down here. Thank you. I was very touched by that comment about uh, the difficulty in the north with that chief, you know, having to boil water for 30 years. Are you considering a sequel, how Canada doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that, that's the point. There are clearly some things that don't work. Um, but we wanted to look at what did work and why it worked and why there were, what works about the situation that the chief is in. I mean, the, clearly the filtration plant doesn't work, and that's a failure on the part of somebody. Uh, that's a government responsibility, those filtration plants. That doesn't work. But what does work is the way he leads his community in times of crisis and extreme difficulty. And his, his ability to show different ways to lead there's a parade of people come, coming into Neskantanga. You know, politicians to claim they're going to fix it or promise if you elect us, we'll fix it. They've heard that for 30 years from different governments. Um, media who come in to tell the story, who promise that their coverage is somehow going to make it, things different. And in the past, what would always happen on these trips is that the visiting politician, the cabinet minister, what have you, would land, to be taken to the count band council office, meet with the chief. Maybe they'd have some kind of small presentation for the minister, and then they'd get on the plane and fly out. What Chief Munoz does when there are people come in, since he's become chief, is he wants the people of the, of the First Nation to talk to the cabinet ministers in open forum, explain what they're living through. The mother, the child, the father, whomever, they each get that opportunity. And the Im impact and the impression on the minister, one assumes, is much greater than if it was just a normal kind of meeting of bureaucracies. So the story we're trying to tell with him is multifaceted, as you'll see when you read it. Um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there are things, as I said right out of the gate, 
There are things that don't work in, in our country. And most of those are at a level above us, above the kind of ordinary people of the country. And what we do is, a, is one of the reasons we love the place is the country does work on so many different levels. And we're lucky it does. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. We're not trying to gloss anything over. There are issues. I named one of them. So that's the best I can tell you. Right over here on this side. Hi there. Hi. So my 24 years of working, I've had 25 jobs. And I mean, the longest they've been like five, six years, but I've worked multiple jobs at a time. Um, everywhere from working at a funeral home to working at an adult store to building bank machines and Blackberries. So I'm just wondering, how did you go about picking what jobs for the book? Like, right. was there other interviews that just didn't make the cut? Uh, no, every interview that we did made the cut. And that's kind of remarkable, really, because you'd think we would have run into some kind of duds along the way. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't happen. Everybody, every, and when I mean duds, I mean people who were... Had Journalists? Time, had, had a hard time expressing uh, themselves or describing their jobs. It, uh, so we, we were lucky on that. We never ran into that. How did we pick the jobs? It was really, we sat down and thought, we want to cover the country. We want jobs that we wouldn't necessarily think about on a normal day. And just go for it. There was no scientific process. We didn't do any like big time surveys or research into, you should really look at these jobs. We just went on our kind of gut instinct uh, as to what to go for. And then we had to find people who were willing to talk. And in, in every, t now I gave you some idea like how we found the window washer. It wasn't, you know, it didn't go to some guy on the street. Uh, I went through, we went through the research on a, a lot of these things uh, to try and determine who might be interesting, who's talkative, who's, you know, uh, interested in, in their job to the point where they like talking about it. Uh, and so that's, that's basically uh, how we went about it. You know, if we, we've already had, you know, requests to do, <laughs> to do another uh, volume with other jobs, with suggestions about what kind of jobs. Like somebody said to me the other night in, uh, I think it was Calgary, I've been on this kind of tour for the last 10 days. And in Calgary, somebody said, why is there, uh, why is there no journalist in there? <laughs> And I said, that's a very good question. But uh, we decided early that we didn't want this to be about us or our jobs. There's lots to say about journalism. And I'm sure I wouldn't have to prod very far in this room to hear some of your feelings about the state of journalism today. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think we could go wrong by looking at any job. Um, because I, I feel that the case we're making here is that they all contribute. They all contribute in a meaningful way to the way the country works and to how we're all connected. Oh, we have a hand back there. And there was also this lady who had, was given the microphone for a second and it was ripped out of her hand. <laughs> Oh, good give it to somebody else. <laughs> uh, this is more of a comment. I just want to mention the reason I bought the book today is I think now more than ever we need feel-good stories. We need things to inspire us. And so rather than how Canada doesn't work, maybe next your next book could be how can us ordinary Canadians help make Canada work better? Sure. Sure. That's a good idea. Good stuff. We'll, we'll think, definitely think about that. Thank you uh, for coming today. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, I just have a quick question about AI. And I wondered if uh, anyone brought it up in their conversations or if you have any comments about how that impacts jobs in Canada. Right. 
Um, when we started work on this book, AI was kind of a thing of the future that um, not a, a lot of people thought about or definitely didn't understand. Uh, you know, it's, it's better now than it was then in terms of an understanding uh, to the point where we could have just pushed a button and said, <laughs> give me a seven-page story from a high-rise window washer and it would pop out. You know, that's the, that's the danger of it. Uh, but it, too, is changing the nature of work, right? Um, and some may argue f uh, for good it's changing. Others are going to argue uh, that this is going to destroy the whole nature of work. Um, so uh, the basic answer to your question is when we were doing the interviews, it was still too early in the process for it to be uh, uh, talked about. Um, but it is increasingly getting to that point now uh, where we're going to watch we're going to watch how some jobs will change. I'm not sure that many in this book will change. Some will. Some will be impacted by our AI. Um, you know, I, I've been impacted by, uh, by AI. I mean, uh, I'm retired. I'm 75 years old, but I'm still doing a lot of work. Still doing a lot of journalism. I do a daily podcast. I give speeches. I advise a couple of companies, I do a number of things. Um, and I'm teaching at the University of Toronto on occasion. But I, 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 assign, I have a, a contract for media advising with um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the major banks. And <laughs> they wanted to do, they wanted to do a present, they wanted to do a presentation using AI where they could have a young Peter talk to an old Peter. And they, they, they dummied up an, an idea for me to show me what it would look like. And it was, li you know, it was me from a newscast in the 1980s uh, talking to me uh, from today. And it was very real. I got to say, it was scary real. Um, but fortunately, the CBC, who owned the rights to the early Peter, yes, very good. <laughs> said, you can't do this. Yeah. We, we're not going to give you authorization uh, to do that. And, and good for them. Yeah. Um, because if we start allowing our journalism to be used that way, manipulated that way, we're in real problems. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a, one example of how it can be a problem. It could be a problem in a lot of other ways other than journalism, too. I have been told that this will be the last audience question. Peter, thank you uh, for being here. And Joe, it's good to see you and hear you again as well. Uh, Peter, when the big story is breaking and uh, you know all hell's breaking loose, what centers you? What keeps you calm to do your job and, and be calm to the public, to the audience? Well, I, you know, I, I learned early on that when the big story is breaking, uh, things change, including facts, change very quickly. You know, the first time I was thrust into a situation like that was in, uh, I guess it was about March of 1981. And Ronald Reagan had just been shot in Washington. And the story went from uh, nobody was hurt to his press secretary was shot and was killed. Turns out he wasn't killed. To Reagan, uh, no bullet touched him. He was saved by the Secret Service. To Reagan was shot and, and almost died on the hospital table. Now, I reported all those things at different times. But I reported them as fact when they were first handed to me. Ever since that day, I've learned to, one, be much calmer, two, not assume anything until you're absolutely convinced from the sourcing that it's true. So that was 1981. 
And I've done an awful lot of shows since then. Um, but people talk about my journalism during the 9-11, uh, where I was on the air for 44 hours straight, um, and various other moments. There's nothing really compares to 9-11, but, you know, I was in Afghanistan, I was in Iraq, saw a lot of stuff where you got to, you know, you got to be calm. I wasn't a foreign correspondent or war correspondent. I was only there for a limited amount of time each time, but I learned from those who were there a lot longer about how to deal with situations and how to understand that when you're in the role I was in, that what you're relying on is the truth and a degree of calmness. You don't need the anchor to be breaking down. I mean, my hero in anchoring was Walter Cronkite, um, who I watched the day Kennedy was assassinated. And Walter Cronkite, on the day he got the news, or on the, in the moment he got the news, basically broke down to the point where they pulled him off the air. It's not, not kind of generally known, but he was taken off the air for a couple of hours, put back on. It's the only time anything like that ever happened to him. This is a guy who landed on the beaches of Normandy covering that story in, in June of 44. And everything that, you know, followed through Watergate and the moon landings and everything. It was the consummate professional. But he had his moment where he kind of lost his calmness. And so did I on the Reagan assassination attempt. So you learn from experience. And you learn what your role is. And your role is to be calm, deal with the truth, as difficult as the story may be. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're lucky in, in my business that there, you know, there are a lot of people who have those, uh, you know, qualifications and attributes. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's an honor to be sitting there dealing, you know, with uh, these kind of stories and trying to uh, keep, in, in my case, as a national broadcaster, a nation comfortable. And sometimes, and Joe probably knows this too, sometimes when you're doing these stories, um, you don't realize the overwhelming impact it's having in the home. I, I can remember on 9-11, I talk about it in my, in my last book, I can remember on 9-11 being on the air all those hours. And I'd been on the air, I don't know, dozen or 15 hours before I got my first break where I had a chance to step out of the studio, kind of, you know, change my clothes and go back in. But when I got into my dressing room, I saw the little light flickering on my phone, which indicated there was a message there. And my phone in the dressing room, the, the only people who had that number were family. And so I picked it up and I, I uh, picked up the message, and it was from one of my daughters who was in Winnipeg. And it, all it said was, Dad, I just want you to know I'm watching you, and I love you. That was it. And it wasn't until that moment that I suddenly realized this is, this is having a huge impact. You know, not surprisingly, but I, you, you just sometimes you don't think about that when you're sitting in the studio. This is having a huge impact around the world. Families are reaching out and touching you. Because my daughter didn't phone me, <laughs> rarely ever. Uh, you know, and certainly not when I was at work. Um, but she did that night, and so did a lot of other daughters and sons and children and grandparents and what have you around the world, certainly around North America. And it connected me then to what was happening out there and the overall impact it was happening. Because sometimes you can be kind of cheated when you're sitting in the studio watching this kind of movie unfold in front of you and you're trying to describe it. And sometimes not realizing 
uh, the big impact that it may be having. Peter, awesome. Great. I could sit here listening to you all day. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It was an honor to be with you this morning. Please join me one more time in thanking Peter and Joe for such a memorable and thoughtful conversation.